Joe Wellstead, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lewis. So, why do you think athletes are so sought after in the business world? I think that there's all kinds of athletes. Like, there's going to be some that um, are not going to be attractive to companies, and there's others that are going to be super attractive. Um, I'm also answering this question as somebody who's never actually had a proper job, but, <laughs> but I have been an employer. Ah, same. Talk, 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 talking to converted, mate. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur all my life, so I haven't really like uh, been in like a, a sort of corporate job, uh, if you like. Um, but I think that my experience as an athlete is that you're always trying to improve, whereas I see a lot of people in the business world who. Um, their sort of default is to not take any risk because if you don't take any risk, you're not putting yourself on the line. You're not putting your, you're not exposing yourself and therefore you're kind of safe. Like you're probably going to keep your job. Uh, whereas I think that that sort of athlete mindset is always to try and get like a little bit of an improvement, um, sort of ask questions about a process and like maybe find ways, suggest ways to improve things, which is like exposing yourself. So there's like a, a certain amount of risk there. But I think that if you're, an employer looking to improve processes or improve the performance of your business, that's super attractive. Mm. I think the biggest thing I am hearing right now, and I said to you before we started, I looked for some data studies. I couldn't find anything to sort of say whether there was a correlation between people who had played sport and then were successful in business. I even looked for things like founders. Couldn't couldn't really there was there was kind of Forbes there was Forbes articles that would say more a subjective opinion that mm. athletes are and that's where i think it's at i think it's a real subjective opinion i don't know i mean you could probably create an objective study just finding out who in c-suite yeah. parts of businesses had played a sport yeah i've certainly seen a lot of swimmers go into finance and do really really well um interesting like a lot um but i think that there's going to be high performers that are going to carry on performing at a high level, like whatever sort of career path they go towards after sports. And there are also, unfortunately, people who their whole like um, definition of themselves is as an athlete, like for me, mm -hmm. maybe a swimmer or for others, a cricket player or a footballer. And then like, it's really difficult to move on from that. Um, so I, I don't know like if statistically overall athletes are going to perform better in business, but I do think that there's a certain type of athlete that's going to perform phenomenally well. Yeah, I get I get what you mean. I think you, there's definitely even that in the sport as well, isn't there? There's there's certain types of athlete that perform phenomenally well in in their games, mm. in their sports, and then business. I, the industry's interest that that's an interesting one. Finance, whether that's a certain type of athlete like a swimmer mm. like a swimmer you, you are different animals like yeah. you, you're built different both physically psychologically in the sense that the monotony of that job because i've done a year of tr swim training before like really dedicated myself to it uh, i was i was actually trying to head towards uh, a paras um trial yeah and i had to dedicate a year to to swimming and man it's intense yeah yeah and but it's the it's the style at which you do that play. I'm used to a ball flying around I'm used to like some sort of external stimulus that's really exciting whereas you're literally looking at a blue line and your head down you can't hear anything can't put headphones on no one's got headphones going on it, it, it's nothing other than doing that so I wonder if finance being yeah there's definitely like a bit of like a geek type mm. mentality you know like how monk mode has become yep. a thing which is probably not the way monks would like it to be, to be described, but uh, don't think they were really looking at monk mode being entrepreneurial, were they? No, no. Um, but I think there is a thing of like kind of getting into your own bubble and just pushing yourself, pushing yourself, pushing yourself. Personally, I think that probably suits entrepreneurship better than most uh, sort of corporate careers. Mm. My, my brother is starting his business. He's now he's just hired his first employee not not his first employee but his first employee that was an athlete hmm. uh i hope his employees don't take offense to that his his, his <laughs> the predecessors but he's genuinely he's currently an athlete he's currently yeah. perform he's still currently working uh, as an athlete and he basically wanted to get him because it's a sales role mm. the resilience side of it was a big thing so being resilient being able to take yeah. setbacks being able to 
face, being able to set goals, be driven towards something. I think, I don't even necessarily think it has to be the measurable, like the statistical measurable ability of a, of a target, but just more the characteristic of it, the, the individual. Yeah. So one thing that I have found like um, building a brand from scratch, but I think this is probably applicable to like all kinds of particularly sales roles is you're constantly like um, putting yourself in a really vulnerable position of being judged. So like if you're, if you're a sales rep for a product um, and you, let's say you're like literally a door to door sales rep and you're going into shops or like going into different venues to try and sell a product or a service, nine times out of 10, people are going to be like really annoyed to see you and they don't want to hear you. And it's kind of awkward. Or like you could be even like, um, in a shop doing sampling. Like I did a lot of sampling with my previous company, Motion Nutrition, where I'd be like in a health food store or something and like giving out tasters to people that like you're constantly exposing yourself to being criticized. I think that's like probably something that if you've been an athlete, you're at least going to be relatively comfortable with like that sort of level of vulnerability and always putting yourself on the line, like maybe not performing at your best or like maybe being open to like really harsh criticism and just dealing with that and carrying on. Swimming has a slight reputation for having that heavy criticism lens towards it. I think there's been some articles that have come out, spoken about certain camps in certain places where, and, and, and actually, do you know what? There's That's probably not just generically in swimming, but definitely some Olympic sports have had some previous British cyclists on and have spoken about those camps being it. So yeah. there's a, and I was speaking to someone last night, actually, who was a synchronized swimmer. Hmm. That's so difficult. Right. And I'd never met a sink swimmer. And the criticism that they faced and at young age, young age, and the need to be stoic in the face of that criticism at a young age, really creating some not I, I don't like using the word trauma, mm. but but mechanisms. Dude, there's a lot of trauma, for sure. I, I, for I sure. agree, I, I mean, agree. I was really lucky with the, like, sort of three coaches that I had that were really influential in my career as a swimmer. But, like, I've heard, like, such rogue stuff on poolside. Like, really bad. Especially towards young female athletes. Like, mm. definitely traumatic stuff that should not be said, for sure. So it, there's there's a line, though, for me to, to draw on the trauma and difficulty side mm. that that I, what you're talking about 100% is going to be trauma I think we now face and I think coming full circle back to the conversation around athletes in businesses I think it's just their ability to face general tough days mm. just a general tough day and their ability to face it as opposed to a younger person right now and I'm probably going to bracket Gen Z into that because they, they are getting some great Raps, they are getting some stick, mm. but I do think there is a general bar a, a a floor that has been moved in that difficulty to to overcome that level. Yeah, so that's going to be interesting. Where perhaps that generation is going to see an even wider gap between high level athletes and and others, where you know you you can sort of participate in sport and get away with like you know a participation kind of medal. Mm. Um, which may be feel nice, but that's going to leave a much, uh, a very different mark to like somebody who's, you know, been in the trenches and like pushed themselves mentally and being like physically and mentally pushed by and like and somebody else, I coach, like to a level that you just wouldn't otherwise. So what attributes do you think have served you well in becoming an entrepreneur yourself? Well, um, so I've, I've sort of pretty much always been in consumer facing businesses and something that uh, I think it's easy to think from the outside that like running a consumer brand is like super cool, like sexy. And this is like partly a founder problem. Like we've made it look like it's a really cool lifestyle because we need attention to sell a product. Right. So like part of that is like the founder sort of story and the founder lifestyle so we've made it look like really sexy and appealing and attractive and like always different you know no day is the same and like people say things like find what you love and you never work in a day you know that kind of thing and it's like actually the reality of being a founder usually is like repetition like it's the same thing every day over and over again and just like trying to get marginally better and that's a really similar pathway to 
you know, when you're an athlete. So you're, you're repeating, repeating, repeating. And it might be just a case of like saying the same thing over and over and over again to people because when you speak to somebody new, they haven't heard it yet before. But you need to give it to them with the same enthusiasm that you did to the very first person that you ever sold a product to. And so that's like mentally really challenging. And people get really bored. Like, you know, I've seen it with partners and I've seen it with um, colleagues and other business founders. Like people genuinely just get bored of repeating themselves. And that's such an important part of the process. That's an interesting point because we actually had a coffee the other day and we were talking about this that I felt with my work, I was talking to people and I was saying the same thing over and over again, but then I was realizing that I was talking to someone new. And that, uh, what you're talking about, the boredom of saying the same thing over and over again, even if you're not recognizing the person in front of you is completely brand new in that conversation that is probably a reason why people become really demotivated. They mm -hmm. stop. And then actually, if you flip that into a sporting context, right, the it sort of correlates quite nicely with not seeing progression yeah. in your sport. Yeah. And you may even have regression some years. Yeah, you might have regression. Yeah, f for sure. No, but that's exactly the same in business. Like, you, you know, when you start off, it's so nice to think that you're always going to have a curve that goes to the right and up. But like, that's not real. Like, or like, if it is, then you you've had a certain amount of luck or you've, or you've been unbelievably successful, but like you need to be, you know, ready to deal with uh, a plateau or even, you know, a downward slope for a bit. Yeah. I had injuries were the thing that caused regression for me, the quite natural thing, but then thinking about it, interestingly, innovation mm. in my skill mm. that caused regression. And right. it was something that like a new technique. Yeah. yeah. And it, well, in cricket, you had to, uh, we would develop new slower balls or right. one day cricket is quite, it's probably right. the most creative format of the game. Sure. Uh, but that requires a person who is highly skilled with a fundamental foundation of skill and then being able to add another layer of, found, uh, of skill onto what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I would try a new slower ball. But with that, I might lose accuracy in one of my foundational skills. Because I had to, there's only a certain amount of balls you could bowl as well. There's only a certain amount of hours I could really dedicate to, to training. So there was give and take with everything. And mm -hmm. there was being really clever with, okay, when I turn up to training, I'm going to be foundational with this. And then I'm, I'm going to spend X amount of literally balls that I'm going to bowl on that. And then I have to do another X amount on this over here. And, and we had to be, well, eventually when you become a, a professional, you have to be restricted. Yeah. So you get restricted in what you can do because of injuries for like just purely not having to break yourself and i i would do that where I, I would do this training where i would essentially give myself that limited a period of time to work on it but it cost there was a cost yeah, benefit you can do something else right yeah doing that, you're taking sure. time away from that yeah. to hone it in to become confident in it make sure it's maintained you're maintaining your confidence in it that's really important and i saw regression yeah just in a butt holding in there and knowing that the foundational skill, I've done enough of the 10,000 hours of practice on that, and I'm just start, I'm really tuning in it. This new, this new skill, trusting the fact that it would eventually come. And once you've so got this, that base level, yeah. it comes quicker, I, I think. I think this is another thing that if you've, met, if you've sort of been aware of this process in, as an athlete, you're maybe more comfortable in business where you cannot get instant gratification. Like, you know, setting up a new process might be super time consuming, super slow, not generate sales immediately and actually damage your business because you, it means you can't focus on like existing customers or, or whatever other part of the business. But if that's part of like the bigger picture to make a big step up, then you need to be okay with that delayed gratification, which I think is a, is very difficult for a lot of people. Yeah, I see that with some of the guys I, I work with right now. The, the other one is having success early mm. and sustained success and not having a speed bump or a failure early, having a period of regression, a period of failure, and then facing it almost three years into the job and then not knowing what it is. Because they've the thing that comes with that success is an ego. Yeah. So their ego comes with yeah. it and then bang. Like but this, is, this is why I think like not all athletes are necessarily going to be great uh, career people. Because you might have athletes that are like unbelievably talented as kids and they kind of become like lazy or complacent. And that's probably like, if you think about the best attitude you could possibly bring to the workplace, that's probably not the one that you want to get. Definitely. Yeah, I, I, I've seen that. I, I can get that. I, it comes sort of full circle back to not every leader, like they're not the best player in a sport, mm. 
is going to be the best leader. Sure. Do you know what I mean? And it's not necessarily the best athlete is going to be the best entrepreneur because it's a total, it's a totally different skill set. You can't, you can't come into business like you have a full attitude in in sport because the actual day to day stuff you do it's so different mm-hmm. and it doesn't flick your switches as much mm-hmm. at the time. And I think that that's really hard to find them the transition of how do I I found this how do I change over from going in the gym physically doing something to then having to stand and sit, sit and write emails right and the other thing is you will the, the context and the environment of like performance sport is everybody's thinking with a performance mindset then you go into work where you might have that performance mindset but you're dealing with everybody else who just wants to do the least work possible and go home and that can be really frustrating because you're like you want to move forward and everybody's sort of like whoa let's not push too fast cowboy you know it's, it's a little bit like when you you know we were talking about some athletes will go into like media training days or all this stuff and just visibly they don't want to be there like that energy is really difficult to deal with i think when you go into a workplace and people just don't want to be there or don't not really care they just want a paycheck that that can be a frustration yeah so when you started out what was your sort of vision when you when you finished sport what's your vision as you've left sport then honestly like i don't think I, i knew really um i think i was just sort of presented with certain opportunities and and just tried to make the most of them uh, I, yeah, I was 24 years old, so I, I don't think I can say that I had a really clear vision other than I, I knew I didn't want to just apply for jobs. I wanted to like build things or like, uh, have certain amount of freedom. Um, I don't think I've ever dealt very well with like authority as in like, you know, when, uh, you have like maybe a coach who's very authoritative and like kind of drilling you like a sergeant like that. I do not respond well to that. So like. I had this idea that like that's what work would be like, so I, that was really not attractive to me. So that was that was pretty much the extent of it. Like, let me make find ways to make money that don't involve having a difficult boss to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> what? So why why did you get in? I mean, you went into performance nutrition. Mm. Sounds kind of like it's an easy segue from sport. It's something you knew that company Motion. Why did you want to start? Why did you want to start that? What gap were you seeing, or what did you want to create? So we, we started working on it in 2015. And at that point, um, it was quite clear that like, uh, sports supplements were really, really growing very fast, um, and going far beyond like actual performance nutrition, like going far beyond elite sport or bodybuilding and into like the realms of, you know, people's smoothie for breakfast and like sort of regular, almost transitioning actually from supplement more towards food. Like it was sort of becoming a regular household item. Um, and yet the products were really the same, or maybe they were like slightly tweaked in branding. They were maybe a little bit less male dominated, but then like the sort of default response to that from brands was to make like really girly pink Barbie doll type packaging for women. And I was like, this is, this ain't it. Like this is not, <laughs> this is not the future of, of like sports nutrition. So that was the gap that we saw was, hang on, can we make like genuinely really healthy products that are not for elite sport? They're actually for people who maybe have a job, maybe work out like, three to five times a week and they know they need to hit like certain amount of protein they know they need to like sleep really well they don't need to have like mental performance through the day and like sort of positive mental energy so that they can do their work and then still have energy left over to go do a workout that was what we were interested in like not necessarily improving like one percent marginal gain for athletes but actually let's look at the wider potential application of these products and make something that's really attractive to a wider audience when i don't know if you've had this when you left sport did you struggle with the transition of regimented really grinding your way at a in the gym in the pool and then trying to figure out what your fitness lifestyle looked like outside um yeah a little bit i definitely had like a moment of like hmm, what am i going to like what, what's this going to look like next um again like i, I think i just sort of found things and just went like really hard like Mm. you know sort of like applied my energy to something new so like the first like three or four years after swimming i just went hard into calisthenics i I guess i was just kind of lucky like i met a couple of guys who were into calisthenics and we started training together like at kennington park like it was it was just like the sort of natural thing for me to do because it was there in front of me and once i found that i was just like well let's go you know let's like 
apply all my sort of excess energy towards this. And it's cool because when you learn something new after like you know, in performance sport, you're like looking for such minute improvements, like every day, every week, every year. And then you go into like something completely new where you're completely a rookie. And yeah, fine, it's like humbling or whatever, but also your progression curve is like really steep. So that's like really rewarding. Like whenever, you know, picking something completely new after doing everything for one sport is really cool. Well, what's an unbreakable goal? Right. So this is something that I kind of um, found to be true when I left swimming I don't think I ever really realized that during it but I realized post my swimming career what happened over a certain span of years and in 2010 there was the Delhi Commonwealth Games trials in Scotland and I, I just moved to Scotland from having grown up in France but I I was born in Scotland I was I was Scottish I, I am Scottish um and that first year in Scotland I went to the trials and I was just like obliterated like I was just nobody I was like sideline like marginal to the competition you know like whether I was there or not didn't really change anything I was not to the right level for that um and at that point my coach said sort of said to me like well I didn't even know four years later it was going to be Glasgow Commonwealth Games like home games I was like not even aware of it and she said well you know if you decide like if you want to commit like you'll be in those games in four years and I was so far away from that that I was like it's kind of ridiculous like I don't I don't know if that's possible so it's one of the unbreakable goal is that one of these things where it might seem slightly out of your reach as possible uh, at first um and it, I think it's helpful for somebody external to give you that goal because they can maybe be a little bit more objective as to like what's possible for you to achieve some people might say like I'll be Olympic champion and realistically not going to happen other people will say like you know I'll I'll win like a county medal or something and like that's way too low for like what they could achieve so i think it's helpful to have an external party and it's a goal that sort of gives you like butterflies makes you feel a little bit giddy like oh really could i be that person but it's also just close enough to like your realm of imagination that you can dedicate yourself and think hmm actually if i do work towards this relentlessly maybe i can be that person so it's sort of in between like not quite unrealistic but far enough that you're not going to achieve it like next week. Hmm. That's interesting that you would get a coach to do that. And I like that idea because most people set their own goals. Hmm. You get to, well, I got to the new year. You set your goals for the year. What do I want the end of 2024 to look like? But actually, and for many people, your perception is not necessarily reality. Hmm. Exactly. And I think also for some definitely young people, kids out there I, and I've had I've had some young kids that I've worked with and I say young kids they're they're teenagers they're adolescents that are working towards trying to make it in a sport and when you ask them like why are you doing this what do you want to achieve they look at you to go is that is that good enough like is that right and I go well tell me but they are there's a blend that has to happen so I, I believe you've got, you've got to set your own path a little mm. bit but at the same time if someone is externally telling you I think this is what you can achieve I think this is what they have a they have a much better lens on them on them with faced with reality right so I think they have, are far like you said objective in setting that goal when you may not be because it's all emotional for you yeah, it's all sure. and it will god it will feel great if I get this and yeah. oh I can do that or maybe you even exaggerate achievements in the past that in reality aren't actually that good or maybe you underestimate how right. good a, an achievement was and you you undersell yourself so i think having that person setting a goal externally that's a great idea and something i might even try run with a little bit because i've probably sat in the realm a little bit too long of, of allowing people to set their own goals mm. uh, and i think more, i'm seeing young men especially young women too but they want to be told what to do a little bit. Yeah. They, I think they a lot of young men are guidance. pretty lost right now. Yeah, they need that guidance. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, you know, like, there's lots of examples of incredibly successful people um, who've had a person telling them what they can achieve or what they're worth from a really young age. Like, the Williams sisters is a perfect example. Like, if anybody's seen uh, King Richard, like, you see that whole story of, like, the dad telling these kids that they're going to be Wimbledon champion from, like, age two or something silly. And, like, without that, you know, they had, nobody had ever seen a black woman win Wimbledon. Like, how would they have ever possibly seen themselves doing that without somebody, whether it's their dad or somebody else, telling them 
you're going to do this. Like you are capable of doing this. Uh, you know, it's just, you can't always see what you're capable of doing because you maybe don't have an example or maybe you just can't imagine yourself doing it. Have you heard the story of the Polgar sisters in chess? No. It's a great book. It's a great story from, I first read it in Matthew Side's book, Bounce, mm. which is again, a great book. It talks about how talent is, it, it's essentially it's not just you're not just born with it there's a combination of different things that happen his own story being quite an interesting one as well he talks about how one ingredient within it and making it top is luck mm. and his luck was the fact that he he lived in a certain house and if he lived almost one door to the left that door that house to the left would have meant that he was in different catchment region right, for right, a different right. school sure. which meant he wouldn't have gone to the school that he went to and met the PE teacher that gave him a table tennis racket and that table tennis that teacher would never have introduced him to the 24-7 table tennis club that he'd have gone to. And that table tennis club would have never introduced him to a Chinese coach that changed his technique and allowed him to play at such a high level that made him go to the Olympics, right? And so luck was one of the ingredients. But another one in it was so this engineering mm. of, of human excellence. And Jude, the story of the Polar sisters is essentially the, the father had a pen pal and he had this idea that you could create excellence by sort of man and yeah engineering it you could engineer excellence you could create it it wasn't just nurture uh, it wasn't nature sorry mm. you could nurture it and his thing he so he had a pen pal this this lady he was talking to who's obviously no tinder things like that and he was he was he was not no instagram he was purely writing to it and he had this idea he's like i want to raise children i, I believe i can raise, raise champions she's like i'm in uh, they, let's do it they they then had their first daughter who the and the sport they chose was chess hmm. and they wouldn't allow the child to play chess until they were five years old but up until five they could just play with the pieces get the dexterity of the piece right. in their fingers five years old they see their parents playing chess they were good chess players themselves and then they would eventually five years old they started playing so that first daughter grows up to become a world champion but then the second daughter was born and did the same thing saw the daughter the elder sister playing with the mum and dad and they same thing couldn't play till they were five bang 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 she then takes all the trophies and titles off the eldest sister then judith polgar is born the youngest sister and she grows up and she's doing the same thing five years old can't and then gets to play all of them grow up to be world champion judith polgar becomes the youngest ever grandmaster at, at 15 wow. um and and the, and the highest ranked female chess player now i'm probably butchering some of those stats as well but she is it, it, she's an in, incredibly it's an incredible story and i mean he then finished turned around and was like look i've created three yeah. grandmasters essentially yeah. and and someone a, then a turned lot of people around. look at that and go that's not okay you know well, yeah <laughs> just totally. on the outside like <laughs> totally totally and he 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 sort of said right okay well these are this is the thing but the the interesting part of the story was there were these little nuanced moments where he never pushed them into doing mm. it because he made them not play until they were five. Right. And that was instilling this family element of it. It was a thing that mm. they did. It was a thing that b bonded them together. And it was something enjoyable. That's so they, so they, cool. they became, they became sort of, there was a bit of FOMO. Yeah, right. right. For, so you, you, you actually want to do it. It was not, you are going to, to yeah. sit and play sure. chess. It was play it if you want, but this is enjoyable. Yeah. And they just became amazing at it, right? So, and then they paved the way and made so the Again, there's like, like Naomi Osaka in tennis. Mm. Her parents... I mean, according to them, they got together and they were like, let's have kids that are going to be tennis champions. But before having a kid. <laughs> and Naomi Osaka was like number one, one, I think four grand slams. Um, so yeah, anyway, I don't, I don't remember why we got onto this, but there's lots of examples. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just more about, those, we were talking about setting those goals from external right, point right, of view, having it. someone set those goals for you. And it's just something I've never considered, really. I, I've not... I've not thought of it placing a goal. I think I see it, I have seen it maybe for too long as placing a goal onto someone as you, again, telling them what to do and knowing as well, like that is not the I mean, ideal think, way maybe, of doing it. Maybe you it. want to apply it to everybody. Like, you know, maybe Michael Phelps was like, always knew he was going to be multiple Olympic mm -hmm. champion swimming um, and he didn't need anybody to say that. But certainly in my experience, I needed somebody to sort of open my eyes and go, this is what you can do. Oh, sweet. So that was that was my uh, unbreakable goal. What are unbreakable rules? Well, unbreakable rules is sort of what comes next because, like, um, you know, you can have a goal, but like, how are you how are you going to get there? Um, 
And so before having that goal in 2010, um, that the first year that I spent, uh, this was at Sterling University, um, I was somebody who'd done all my school in French in France, land in Scotland, go to Scottish University, join this like swimming program that I was really unfamiliar with. Like there's all these terms that I don't know. Um, I can't understand half the people because of their accent, even though I'm like officially Scottish, it was like kind of embarrassing. Um, I wasn't used to like super early morning training. So I was really, it was really quite depressing that first year. And I missed a lot of morning sessions where like my alarm went off and I would just not get up and just, just go back to sleep. So then I set, I decided to set my own rules for myself, which I think like will sound really um, kind of harsh maybe to, to others. But for me, it was actually giving me the freedom to not have to decide the same things over and over again. So one thing was when my alarm goes off, I get up. I don't, I don't even switch it off. I, I literally physically stand up so that like, you, you know, you're not tempted to snooze. So that was just like something that I did, like alarm goes off and I'm up. Um, another thing was, uh, you know, how many meals I had through the day. Like, cause I realized that if I, if I skipped a meal or as in a meal, like I'd have like five a day. Right. So it's not just like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like you need to fuel a lot more than that when you're swimming. And I realized that if I skipped one of those, like maybe a mid morning snack, or like mid afternoon snack before training, I would really underperform. So instead of like every day going, you know, three o'clock comes and you're like, oh, I should probably, you know, should I have something to eat? I don't know. Nah, screw that. Just like, I know this is my time. I need to eat something right now. Like I know that two hours before swimming, I need to be basically full. So I, like once I set that, I know because I set that because I know that I need two hours to digest it. If I eat any later, I'm going to feel like bloated and stuff in the pool. If I eat any earlier, I'm not going to have enough energy. If I don't eat at all, I'm going to completely screw it up. So like why decide these things every single day? Like bedtime. Um, I was like, I think a sort of 9.30 p.m. in bed was pretty much my rule. And then like 10 p.m. asleep. So like I'd give myself half an hour to read or whatever. And there'd be no phones or anything. I would just be like reading a book. Um, again, this might sound really harsh, especially as a student. Like other people would kind of look at me like weird. Um, but for me, that meant that like I, I was giving myself the freedom of not worrying about that every night. And not having to make that decision every single night. Like if you watch one episode on Netflix and it's 9.15 and the show lasts 45 minutes, I'm like, well, I can't, I'm just not going to. And again, it might sound like really like sad to some people, I don't know. But for me, it was great because you don't constantly have, like you're not constantly relying on willpower. I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. They sort of rely on motivation and willpower. And this like, you know, your January resolutions, like people will say, oh, I'm super motivated to like lose two kilos or I put five kilos of muscle on or whatever. And then they're just like, they have this motivation, right? And they're like, this is going to last the whole year, but it doesn't. Because then eventually you're faced with these decisions every single day over and over again. Like, do I have the packet of crisps? Do I have a pint on a Wednesday night? Like every day you got all these decisions. If you could make that decision once and set it as a, as an unbreakable rule, like for the year or for five years or however long, however long you want to set it, that's so freeing. And you don't, you're not wasting all your mental energy on like going over this thing every single day. Well, the thing you're talking about is the different, the difference between motivation and discipline. Yeah, but I think to discipline only comes if you know what matters and if if you set those rules up front. You know, you can say like, oh, I'm going to be super disciplined and like go to the gym every day. Like people do that in January. Not realistic. You're not going to do it. So like your discipline, you're going to feel really shit about yourself in six weeks time because you're not sticking to it. Like, you know, you need to think about these things a little bit more carefully and like, okay, this is going to be my rule and my discipline is going to be obeying that rule. And maybe part of this is like, if one week out of five, I don't do that, like, you know, it's okay. I think that's where people miss this the most is that they are now foregoing the long-term pride for the short-term pleasure that they feel in holding onto the phone a little bit longer or <laughs> not turning that Netflix series off one episode earlier and you forego the pride of being able to reflectively look back and say to yourself I made that decision I can I'm in control I think when we are going from TikTok to Instagram to all the average these devices that are drawing us in we're completely out of control mm -hmm. and I I know that the simplistic definition of say anxiety or stress is trying to control something you can't control but you want to control it right 
So we're all trying to feel like we're in control. We want to feel in control of our lives, but we're completely at the mercy of a frigging iPad or a phone, a piece of technology. And I have found this year that I've done little things that have created more disciplined action. And a lot of people that maybe know me go, I think hell it's like you're quite disciplined and to the nth degree, but personally, I don't see it. Like, and yeah. I, but I, there's parts of me that I know I'm, I'm lacking in and I'm not, I'm not where I want to be that gives me not to achieve anything, just to feel better. Hmm. They're like, I'm in control of this thing. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's really simple for like getting up, having a morning stretch. It's, it's doing, just simply 10 minutes of mindfulness meditation things like that now people might think oh god well it's actually no i can get up a little bit earlier and do it mm. i'm not stretching for an hour yeah i'm just do my hamstrings feel tight i do that right i or the next morning my shoulders feel tight i do my shoulders right and then it's the 10 minutes of meditation that when i can look back on the day and, and also that 10 minutes of meditation i can move that like i can i don't i don't have to apply that into a yeah. certain nth degree every day but i can move it around and it's the reflective pride that is the better feeling for me than yeah. the being drawn in and at the mercy of this yeah. device i think like for me all, all of these sort of self-imposed rules are kind of about kindness to yourself mm. um and people see it as like uh saying no to things i see it as saying yes to what i want you know so like that's it just like for me i had to sort of reframe that like i'm not saying no to going out for drinks i'm saying yes to feeling good tomorrow you know like that that's to me that's self-kindness you know like others see it as like oh you're missing out you know you're too harsh on yourself like maybe in certain occasions but overall like it's me being kind to me my, my brother made me realize that in business he was he, he always reminds me he's like if you're saying yes to that you're saying no to something else right because in business it's actually it's just so finite in mm -hmm. what you can do with your time so like if you're saying yes to this what are you saying no to and i try to keep reminding myself each week what am i saying yes to this week what am i saying no to or, or what is that yes taking me away from and it, is it the right thing and that makes me then make the better decision on is that the right thing for me to be doing right yeah. now should i be doing spending my time there can i delegate it can i move it on um again that's more being in control of probably the things that you want to be in control of yeah exactly you said about learning to trust and delegate after being the one in control as an athlete what's mm. that feeling like for you now are you able to delegate having because yeah well, as an athlete i was something i was interested about we are always in control we mm -hmm. in control of everything mm -hmm. so how do you find delegating now in business when you were the one in control and you'd have to forego that really difficult <laughs> yeah like i've had to yeah, I'm, I'm always learning about how to do this because I think that when I first realized that this is a problem for me, I went too far. I like trusted people that I probably maybe shouldn't have or like just gave away too much, um, too fast. And like, that's also not ideal for business performance. So like, I'm definitely learning about how to do that and how to get better at it. And also I learned what I'm not good at. You know, this is the whole point of delegating is like not just the case of like me being efficient with time. It's like there's stuff that I'm just really bad at. So like, I should not be doing So like, it's just like really being really kind of brutally honest with yourself. Like I should not be doing that. You know, when, when you, you know, you sort of learn as an athlete to deal with your weaknesses. Right. And like you can decide whether to improve your weaknesses or just like kind of ignore them and improve your strengths. Like you can't do that in business like <laughs> your weaknesses is great you should be able to go okay well that person's going to deal with that stuff because i'm crap at it um but not not an easy thing mm. what's the things you like doing the most um i think so you know i kind of consider myself a brand builder like i really like to find um well, okay, first of all, to create a fantastic product, but then like to find ways to communicate it to the, to the people that I want to talk to in, in a way that they're going to understand. Um, so with Motion and now with my new brand, like it's, we've been sort of taking products that maybe sort of exist, you know, tweaking them a little bit, making them, we think better, but actually a lot of it is making it really simple for people to understand and then really simple to use. So sometimes it might be, well, we're going to sort of forego a little bit of like performance or accuracy 
uh, not necessarily performance, more like accuracy and the interest of convenience. You know, so with with electrolytes, there are products where you can literally measure like to the drop uh, of a of a liquid electrolyte that you're going to use, which might be what an Ironman athlete wants to do, but in terms of like getting electrolytes in first thing in the morning when you get out of bed and like doing it every single day, that's not ideal. Like you need convenience. So that's what I love is like finding something, making it like distilling the essence of it, like why it should matter to people and communicating it and making it really clear and easy. I think that's the, that's again, this difference between optimizing and maximizing because most people, an a Ironman will definitely be, an Ironman athlete will definitely want to be checking out every milliliter mm. and 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 because that will be the thing that makes them feel in control mm. so that should they win or not get the position they want in the race they can maybe tweak it or know what did or didn't work and, and just at least have that compartment of their life sorted because yeah. that is a for their sport it's a huge part of it right nutrition and hydration massive important part but there are i i think there are other part sports i take mine for example highly skilled sport so the physical element of it massively boosts it but it's if you you could be the biggest and best athlete in a sport like cricket but if you don't have the skills you you can't play Mm. right so there is an element of give and take in those those realms of what you do so you want to maximize one part of your but you don't need to optimize it because if you were to focus on it so much and i fell into this category definitely i used to really overthink about my physical work to probably the detriment of my skill now i kind of caveat that with my story my condition knowing that if i physically was struggling it made the sport three five times harder so Mm. i really had to focus on it Mm. but i've known other players in the sport that they really need to focus on the skills and you do and so getting hydration you just need it to be convenient you don't need to know the empty you just need to know am i hydrated am i fueled enough right can this work rather than being on the field trying to do your skill where there's already enough self-doubt and demons getting in rather than having this, did I take five milliliters right, or 10 right, right. milliliters? And the crazy thing about this is like, we still see brands like, you know, sort of hammering this idea or, or like sort of fitness influencers ham- hammering this idea of like measuring exactly, you know, your macros, measuring exactly how many calories you're taking in. Like there's been studies on this stuff for decades now. You know, in my fitness pal was a big thing. Like everybody was tracking the calories on my fitness pal and tracking like their you know, their macros, protein, carbs, and fat. Like everyone. Like before we had like clever apps that were doing it, we were like inputting stuff on, on the app. Um, there's been like massive studies on this stuff that showed it didn't improve body weight. Like it didn't. It just did not. In fact, people got fatter. Like <laughs> so, so. This whole idea of like measuring everything to the nth degree and being really, really precise with what you put into your body is actually detrimental to what most people want, which is to sort of be lean and strong. Uh, and nobody seems to be paying attention to this or learning from it. So my view is actually like, let's just tick this box for you. Let's make sure that you're properly hydrated um, and that you don't have to worry about it anymore. Because the alternative is looking at it so much that eventually you get to the same result. You're hydrated but also you're super stressed. And this is why like I have gone through the whole like whoop thing and like whole wearable device thing. And like, I've really enjoyed it, but also I walked away from it because beyond like a period of sort of three to six months to test stuff, I found it really stressful. Like having all of these data points, having something that tells you like how you should be feeling every day when you wake up, like I just did not find it helpful to feeling good every day like it's just too much information i just want stuff to be like ticked off yes i'm hydrated yes i've fueled well yes i've slept well yes i'm going to be outside and get a lot of sunshine like you know basic stuff like i'm good you know and then i can focus on what i want to focus on mm. well let's do the first ever podcast so sort of live demo sweet of a of a product so you've created ocean mm-hmm. which is a very this is the first time i've seen the bottle which is slick it's stylish really clean you were talking me through the where this has come from yeah and how it is and people that can't that are not watching it on video it's in a um, pump dispenser Mm -hmm. which is unique to a electrolyte product yeah i've not seen it then before no because it looks like hand soap yeah right but yeah so talk us through sort of why this started where it came from and then well or should we just try it yeah let's do do it so right do you want to do it like do you want to so this is this is what I mean in terms of like making things 
simple and convenient. Like um, most electrolytes, probably most electrolyte products are powders. So already you're like, you're gonna have to like shake it or whatever and mix it. So this is just, it's a liquid. So obviously it's in a pump dispenser and it's it's a lot more, uh, when you were first described now, it's, it's a lot more, um, it's less viscous than what I thought it was gonna yeah, be. Yeah, it's right. basically like super concentrated natural electrolyte, kind of like saline solution. Yeah. So I've got two glasses of water. Oh, I can just open it. You need to open it. I closed it because it was in my bag. Fair, <laughs> yeah. And literally just like one pump and that's it. Like that's, that's the serving. So right, it's unflavored as well. It's unflavored. So if you you know if you drink regular filtered water, like cheers, cheers. Yeah, add it's your water. If you like to drink lemon water, you add it to lemon water. If you like to drink um, iced tea, like any anything, like whatever your favorite beverage is through the day, you add this in. You don't even notice it, and it gets all your like. You can't notice that. No, but interesting. You said to me the other day that it is. You now drink water, and this feels wetter. Right. So. Um, if you think of like pure water, um, you know, just H2O, there's, there's nothing in it. Um, uh, it's, it's like distilled water. Tap water will have a certain amount of minerals in it. If you buy like bottled mineral water, like Evian, it'll have probably quite a bit more minerals in it, but nothing to the level the ocean does. Um, and what those minerals do is kind of make the water feel a little bit silkier. Uh, you like on the first try, you won't really notice it, but after a while, when you've used it for maybe a couple of weeks, and then you drink like regular, especially if it's filtered water, so you, you you've removed like a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that's this in the water, the, that water then tastes dry like, or it feels dry, like it's really weird. Mm-hmm. Like you know when you drink milk, so milk is like high in calcium, right, which is a mineral, and it's got all kinds of other minerals in it. It kind of feels silky, as opposed to water. Mm-hmm. Um, this is kind of like with ocean, obviously it's not milky or anything like that, but you give that sort of silkiness to the water. You know, when you have Evian water, it's like slightly silkier than tap water. That's the sort of thing that you get with ocean. I don't know if everybody's going to re- notice this when they have it. It's just something that I've realized after using it for a little while and then having fil- like regular filtered water with nothing added, it feels dry. It's really weird. I mean, I'm horrendous at hyd- hydration. It's the, it's the number one thing that... I so we go back to goals, right? Mm. Of of how do you you set your goals and you try to um, nail everything in the first w- week or month, and you try to do everything. Uh, I, you must have come across Jesse Itzler, have you, yeah, uh, yeah. So he's married to Sarah Blakeney, mm. who um, created Spanx, yeah, power couple, literally, yeah. right? And he had this. I jumped on his sort of vision this year. Which was he creates one misogi, six challenge, six they challenges or there's six events that he goes on, uh, and a misogi being a life defining moment. So it could be cycling across Europe, it could be running a five k for anyone, right? It could, it's some sort of life defining moment mm-hmm. you maybe mm-hmm. haven't done before. But the challenges were almost these. Uh, they were six events that you do one every two months. And you, you add that up into your lifetime and it was sort of 150 right. Kind of events, right? But he talked to then about creating one new habit every quarter. Right. Which I liked. Mm. I really liked doing one every quarter. I then kind of switched it and said, I'm going to remove one habit, unhealthy habit, right. every quarter cool. or add one every quarter. Yeah, so don't talk about the removing stuff. No, God. And I, I did a whole video on sort of 24 unhealthy habits that you could choose to remove mm. like you don't have to remove all of them but it was the it was the idea that okay if i want to create a healthy habit so if i want to become more hydrated i need to remove the unhealthy habit that is standing in the way now i'm a massive coke zero fan right and and it's it's i don't know where that's kind of, it's just i don't i love prefer coke zero rather than having a big glass of coke or whatever but for me it then gets in the way of yeah. me hydrate so i don't yeah. buy it yeah right so if I am going to have it, yeah. I have it outside of the house, or I right. have it, and I've made that decision this quarter. Yeah. That's smart. That it's it's now if I'm having dinner, it's with a glass of water, mm. or it's it might even be juice. It could even be ocean with juice. Mm. Can you have can you have it with juice? Sure. Like you could flavor it, yeah. right? So yeah, it could be that. Yeah. And that would then be me being able to be hydrated mm. rather than having a glass a, a can of yeah. Coke Zero. I think, I think like that's probably quite common, but for most people, what we will try and do is remove the habit of having coffee first thing in the morning, which I think is super common for people. I've removed that one. Right. Yeah. So I used to get up 
have a coffee, then run to the gym. Right. I couldn't figure out why my heart rate was 150. So <laughs> it's not good for stress, man. Like, oh my God. Cortisol goes through the roof. So what I would do is I would get up, have a glass of water, stretch, sort of have that decompression, yeah. sort of decompression from sleep. But you know what I mean? Get yourself ready. Yeah. And I'd do that. I'd still actually eat. I, I would still eat something, but I would go to the gym. I'd be at the gym for an hour, hour and a half because I run to the gym and I run mm. back. And then I come back and I have that coffee. And that was... I mean, it's something to do with your adenosine system, mm -hmm. right? It's something to do with your adenosine system not being fully active for the first 90 minutes of your, your, your waking up. Yeah, morning. it's the whole stress system. Um, if you basically, like, the, caffeine is one thing, but then, like, nicotine is another. So, like, if you're loading up your stress system first thing in the morning, like, your body's just going, like, crazy because already like your cortisol peak is is naturally in the morning when you get up um so if you load that up too much then you're going to be basically on a on a roller coaster all through the day that's also why like if you do things like have a coffee and something sweet for breakfast like first thing in the morning you're going to spike your cortisol and your blood glucose you're going to feel amazing for like an hour and then come like 10 or 11 you're going to be like absolutely crash dead you're going to need another coffee. You're going to go for like maybe a Mars bar or another like sweet pick-me-up thing or maybe like a bag of crisps or whatever. Like that's not super healthy. Well, that, <laughs> and, and you don't feel great doing that. That was the other thing. If you have a, if you have these unsweetened zero calorie derivatives, mm. the they have a mechanism in them. I don't know what it is. I'm, I may need to get some sort of dietitian nutritionist on the, to talk about what that is, but the triggering part of it that makes you want something sweet so if i for example if i have a if you have a coke zero you might reach for a bag of crisps yeah right and that is a saltier treat which makes you then yeah. more dehydrated yeah. or makes you feel dehydrated and They're also like there's the science of like what happens in your body but personally for me the biggest thing is actually what happens to your palate mm. like if you're constantly drinking coke zero or other kind of sweetened beverages or sweetened foods like protein bars with lots of sweetener you don't taste anything else. Like you do not. You just stop tasting other foods. So like suddenly, like a red pepper becomes super boring and not interesting. So suddenly, you're not really eating any like vegetables or fruits because all you need, all you want, and all you crave is like like powerful flavors, like flavored crisps and flavored drinks and all this other stuff. So like you're just completely screwing up your palate. So that means you're not you're no longer interested in anything else. Is there anything to do with that? Why oceans unflavored? Yeah. So one of the big. Re well, big reason for ocean is a like there's a lot of electrolytes out there but everything is kind of sports and performance focused which kind of leaves like 99 percent of the population out who are not in like to iron man or triathlon or like super endurance events like it's not nothing's made for them and b like all those products are super sweetened and super flavored like personally i don't want that when i get out of the, of the bed in the morning like i want something that's going to hydrate me but not going to like coat my teeth with sweetener you know like i don't like there's a moment a moment in time where i might want that i might want like a really sweet flavored drink uh, but not all the time what i love with ocean is i can I basically prep like a liter bottle um in the evening before going to bed so just use filtered water a liter of water two pumps of ocean and then i can sip that through the night like if you ever wake up thirsty in the night you can have a sip of that and it's not like it's not kicking off your digestive system it's not giving you any flavors and then when I wake up in the morning, I get up and I drink that liter of water like first thing. Like I don't need to tank it immediately, but I drink it like in the first sort of 10 or 15 minutes that I'm up. And again, like that gets all of my electrolytes in, makes me feel really nice, completely hydrates me after the night where, you know, you're breathing maybe with a bit of mouth open or like you're a bit hot and like you're basically losing a lot of fluid, completely hydrates me and doesn't make me then crave like, you know, chocolate cornflake so like chocolate cereal or something super sweet for breakfast that you know if you're having like one of those fizzy electrolyte things that's really really sweet you're gonna you're gonna want something sweet after that yeah the explosion in our palates mm. is a really good it, of, of describing that that we are constantly craving this ne next sort of mouth orgasm to come <laughs> right much, do you yeah. know what i mean you, <laughs> it's actually like just just chill it out and just yeah. just make it boring for a bit <laughs> like that but it my my granddad used to have a a saying that was if it tastes good spit it out <laughs> <laughs> well you know hopefully like if you're not loading yourself up with sweeteners you can taste stuff that tastes good <laughs> yeah that's what i mean but it's but i i i said this um i said this the other day about if we are constantly 
doing the things that feel good to us, then they they almost we become numb. Yeah, that becomes, to other your, yeah, becomes your your like status, right? Same with nicotine. Actually, like I believe in microdosing nicotine is awesome. Like it makes you feel like so alert, and like you start, you know, statistically you'll t- type faster. Do you do it? Yeah. H- how do you do it? Uh, I use like a spray, like a one milligram spray. Okay, I had it before this. Did you really? Yeah. Right, okay. And it just like makes your brain like really fire up. So your speech improves, your typing speed improves, your more like your reaction times will be quicker. Like it's really, really cool. So when I was swimming, like um, when I went to international competitions, there would be uh, Russian guys, Russian sprinters. They'd have an espresso and a cigarette before their race. And I was like, what the hell is wrong with these guys, right? But actually they were having caffeine and nicotine, which were both two incredible and legal stimulants. But anyway, so fascinating like as a microdose thing, also has potential um, like brain health benefits, like protective benefits. So it might even help with like preventing um, certain brain diseases. Uh, but if you have it all the time, it's basically constantly hyping up um, your happiness hormones, like your serotonin and things like this. Uh, and then you basically start to not feel happiness or excitement from things that should bring you happiness and excitement. So something that happens in your life that should make you feel like uh, ecstatic suddenly feels really dull because like you're constantly hyping up your system with all this nicotine so like that's another thing where same as flavor like if you're constantly hyping up your system you don't notice the stuff that should give you some joy wow i never really realized that about nicotine i never had considered it i think you just instantly think of nicotine and cigarettes yeah you think that's the, the problem that's the only thing that i'm, I'm and even like i would never vape like it's Oh god, yeah, no, <laughs> just does not appeal. I don't have many icks in my life, but that's one of them. Yeah, and and I'm sure that we will slowly discover all kinds of issues with putting that amount of flavored vapor in our lungs. Um, anyway, like nicotine on its own is 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 none of those things. Yeah, I. Is there how much of it are you microdosing? So, once every other day? Is it how often? Um. Basically, whenever I have like sort of tasks that I want to really like, hyper focus on, um, super helpful. Yeah. Or I, I also run a production company, so like occasionally, if I'm producing a shoot that goes from like, you know, I have days where it's like get up at five in the morning and don't finish till like eleven at night, and then you have to kind of go again the next day, and so you have to be like really switched on for really long amounts of time. And generally, generally in my day to day life, I like to have like you know, sort of dinner at like six or something, like pretty like um, good, like uh, uh, pretty like um, even routine every day. Yeah. But then if I'm on a shoot like this, maybe I'm not going to eat anything until like 10 at night. And that's like really difficult for me. Uh, the nicotine keeps you going. Like I don't want to advertise nicotine because it's like pre- it's, it's, it's it pretty is, addictive, right? It is pretty addictive. But in that scenario, like, I find it really helpful because it keeps my energy up, but also it, it sort of um, uh, stifles hunger a little bit. So this is why like people who stop smoking get tend to get fat put on a lot of weight because suddenly like their appetite goes through the roof um so you, you do have to be really careful because it is addictive mm. interesting one mm. like one to one to, to think about um you you spoke about learning to find happiness before you made it right talk me through that uh i think one thing i realized is for a while i was in this sort of entrepreneur hype where like um and I actually blame VCs a lot for this, where, you know, they're sort of like, you know, telling you to sort of pump in money and pump in growth at all costs. And like, I think a lot of people have been through this over the last few years and just not worry about losing lots of money. Don't worry, like as long as your your growth, like your, your sales go up, like everything is going to be great. So what happens is like as the founder, you basically talk about <laughs> delayed gratification going wrong. You basically project all sort of, success to like a later period of like it might be selling a business for example or it might be like um reaching a certain amount of like sales velocity or like annual turnover or whatever whatever it is like that that's like your north star that you're going for and it's it can become a little bit toxic where you basically don't allow yourself to be happy until you've reached that point um which is unhealthy for so many reasons like even if you do reach that point that doesn't mean you're going to be happy uh, but also, like, why are you not allowed to enjoy yourself now rather than just wait for this, like, external sign of success or something? So that's something I've learned is, like, I don't want to live my life like that. Because you could quite easily go through your whole life 
of of sort of parallel thinking where like you're going through your day to day and like you're sort of going through your chores and going through your day and like doing whatever you need to do but always thinking about like oh what life will be like when I, I achieve x or when i'm here or when i live there or whatever like i don't want to live like that i want to live a way that maybe nothing's nothing's different in my day to day but I'm, I'm going to make sure i enjoy it i'm going to make sure that i'm grateful for what i'm doing i'm going to make sure that i'm you know having a great time with my kids having a great time with my wife we, you know, spend quality time together, quality time socializing, not always thinking about what's going to come next. It's interesting. I've been thinking about this a little bit because the, have you seen Russ Cook, the hardest geezer? Yeah. So he's from Worthing. Right. She's down right. And I've, I've followed his journey. He, little known, and probably people that are watching him and know he's run the length of Africa. Mm. He has done some stuff before that that is wild. I bet he has, because you don't go on that like <laughs> honestly. So he, he's background. done so many. He's done so many things. So I thought I heard about this guy when he had sort of about. So I start following between four to ten thousand followers, right? And he had done things like he ran a marathon, but he drank a beer every mile, oh, right? And then he so he did things like that. Then he buried himself alive. Right then, he he ran ever he he climbed Everest up a a stairwell, sort of down right, the road, right, right. and he he's this is a culmination of a lot of different mm-hmm. things, right? But I have followed this journey, and he's exploded. His journey has exploded in the throughout the year that he's been going up up Africa, and I follow it. And as an athlete, as someone who goes out and achieves, and, and you you set those sort of Type A goals, you look at it, and I go, oh, I wish I could do something like that. Now, I actually watched it and I thought, I'd love the fact that he's gone through Africa, he's met all these different people. He's almost gone on this year holiday. Mm. Yes, he's ran the country. That sucks. Like, <laughs> it's a hard, that's hard. But like, the, the I no doubt the experience he's gained is like an, a monumental, yeah. life-changing one. Yeah. Probably physically, mentally, emotionally. But I also thought of many people that will watch that and think, I want to do something more. Hmm. I want to be the next one hmm. and I want to I want to climb the next mountain. Yeah. And I wrote a piece actually today about saying Africa was his, I have to keep reminding me it was Africa's his journey. Hmm. That's his journey. Do people feel guilty, resentful, jealous? Did you feel the same when someone first scaled Everest, when someone first swam the channel, when someone first ran across America? Hmm. And I think we can fall into the trap of comparing our journey to someone else's and either wanting to do more. And I think this is only a certain type of per some, some people will feel that. Some people will just be purely inspired. But I think my pure message from it was that's his journey. Mm. Like he's going to take from it what you can do in your own yeah. and use it yourself in whatever you're doing. Because I don't know if you felt this, you can sometimes get caught up in seeing other people's achievements and then look at your own and know you're achieving something. You know you are. You've been you've decided to go out on this journey and do it, but you might feel a sense of comparison on the success, the scale of the other person's journey, what it's brought for them compared to your own. Yeah. And I uh, I wondered what you sort of felt on that sort of side of things because you you've created many different things. Mm. Yeah, there's definitely always like comparison and checking out what other people are up to um there's i think like being aware of it is really helpful because then you can sort of stop yourself from going too far um there's a really cool tool that i used that i learned as a swimmer from my performance psychologist which was um about like making sure you can stay focused on yourself and i'll tell you it's really simple um there's basically like five circles in the middle of in the middle of it is like um sort of bullseye center and this is you and your performance uh obviously for me it was a performance in swimming but like it could be uh whatever it is you want to achieve in, in work or life or sport so you your performance is in the middle then the first circle around that is the sort of first layer of externalities and that might be things like um let's say you're going on a job interview and you walk into the lobby and you're like well this place is like really impressive like this office is like you know, one of the biggest offices or like most beautiful offices I've ever been, I've been ever been in. Like, wow, that's the first sort of layer. Then from there, you can really quickly and really easily go to the next layer, which is um, sort of comparing yourself to this environment and saying things like, "Wow, I've never really been in such a beautiful office." Right? Well, everybody here is like dressed really well. 
Um, you know, that's, that's a comparison. And then really easily go to the next circle, which is, oh, I don't think I kind of have dressed well enough for this. Or maybe like I haven't prepared well enough. Like I wasn't, man, I wasn't really prepared for like this kind of stage. Um, maybe this many people looking at me. Like, I don't know if I, uh, I'm as good enough or as, as prepared as, as these other people. So you sort of like starting to doubt yourself really easily from there. You basically go out and go, um, you know, I, I'm not really good enough to be here. What am I even doing here? Like if you get to that like, furthest point when you get to like, what am I doing here? It's really, really, really difficult to get back to that centered, like me and my performance, cool, calm, collected feeling. But if you're aware of stepping out to the first or second circle, it's actually quite easy to come back. You know, it's okay to go, oh yeah, that guy's doing that. Really cool. I'm doing this, you know, cool. Like that's him. This is me. Or like in swimming, it would be like, wow, this, this swimming pool is like really impressive. Like, wow, there's lots of people sitting here like to watch, like cool. Okay. Well, I'm going to go back and focus on the warm up. Like, cause this is what I'm, this is what I'm doing. You know, so if awareness is really important, I think. That's about making the most of whatever's just right in front of you. Like you're in that big facility, there's loads of swimmers. Yeah, and where you can control, right? Yeah, there's yeah. The, all the controllables and all the externalities, which is like boring for athletes because they've gone through it so many times, yeah. but it applies to everything. But that mechanism to go from outside of one circle back and then back, hmm. what is it that you're using to get back in there? Is it just pure awareness? Yeah. yeah. Pure awareness. So like, um, I think if you're unaware... You can really like go from one to circle number five, like in a flash. Did you yeah. use anything like journaling? Did you try and write it down or did you just no? In, did you this, just in this purely context, try to see it? This was just like mainly helpful, like in a competitive environment for me. Um, but again, like in business, it's the same thing when you're running like consumer brands, you're basically up against competition. Uh, so it's like in that moment where you're like kind of face to face with your competition, it's like really, really helpful because in that that's when you're really easily going to go out to like, especially like if you go to a competition and like the other, there's another team, let's say they're like, this is going to sound maybe really trivial, but let's say this team turns up and they're all dressed in black. Like, whoa. They're all like really big and like dressed in all black, same team kit, like sponsored by the best brand, whatever. This is why the, the French rugby coach basically banned in rugby, the world, the calling the New Zealand team, the all blacks. Like they're not the All Blacks, they're the New Zealand rugby team, because giving them this name of All Blacks was like too like uh, putting them too high, like giving them too much of um, an aura. He was like, no, they're just another rugby team from New Zealand, and we're the rugby team from France. That's cool. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think one of the lessons I've learned from myself working with athletes, things like that that I work now, is the the slow gradual process that you get from reframing certain things so it's what i will talk to an athlete about is you might have a negative thought and say you then don't know how to combat it but it's like you you don't know how to do that yet this is a skill set mm -hmm. that you have to develop over time and this whole idea of i see someone else's journey and then i I have to think about what I'm doing. That's not something that's really easy to do over time. You almost have to go, pla practice it over yeah. and over and plan what it is you're going to say to yourself when that mm. occurrence happens and then go and practice it. So when this happens, I will tell myself this. Yeah. When I think this, I will go and tell myself that. Because if you don't have that in place, the what you need to go and focus on, you will just run away with it. Yeah. It's too easy sure. to go out of those circles yeah, that yeah, you're yeah. talking about. You could yeah. go to level five yeah. real quick. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. super fast. Mm. Um, so mate, look, the, the Olympic games is coming up right? and, uh, swimming is, has been a stronghold for, it's, it's a, for Great Britain. It's a, hmm. we're, we're strong in it. Yeah. What do you, you forecast, but we also had a conversation about how do we make swimming more entertaining? So yep. well, first off, what do you, what do you forecast for, for the Olympics? Hmm. Mm. I think Great Britain's been doing really well. They'll, they'll they'll get a bunch of medals, no doubt, um, and and at least a couple golds. But you know you're going to have the US and China that are going to be really really strong. Um, the Chinese, like for a long time, the Chinese were not great at Olympics. They'd sort of do like these suspiciously good results in their national 
competitions <laughs> they're like nobody would be at that anywhere near that, that level at olympics so you're like hmm wonder what's going on there uh but they seem to have sorted this out and uh have got some phenomenal athletes um the u.s as well but britain's got some really 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 good talent um is anyone so, you're really excited by watching at the moment someone you like watching in the pool um well i at sterling uh after sort of in my sort of third or fourth year or so uh, leading up to the Glasgow Commonwealth Games, there's a kid that joined called Duncan Scott, who was clearly like a really talented kid. But when he joined, he was like 15, 16 or something. Um, came to the Commonwealth Games, spent a lot of time together. He was 17 at the time, which I, I have to sort of remind myself because, I, I, yeah, it, it was um, one of those people who came across as really a lot more mature than that. But he's really young. And he's now sort of in his prime. Um, and he, I, I love watching him swim because he's super graceful and always seems to like have something to deliver when it matters so like those kind of athletes are awesome to watch because you're like you don't have any doubt about him sort of bottling it you know like i i have zero doubt about him delivering his best performance on the day which is awesome because you're like that makes you really psyched to watch somebody right whereas you know somebody's like uh ex you know sort of more exposed to pressure and deals with pressure a little bit less well it's like oh are they good no it's less enjoyable You're like worried for them <laughs> whereas watching Duncan is always great because he's always got a performance up his sleeve um I used to uh I used to race with Adam Peaty quite a bit um you know, phenomenal talent so uh it'd be really cool to see him win a third Olympic gold in the 100 breaststroke this year uh yeah so those are probably my two because I I, you know, I, I raced with or against them. So it's, it's great to see them still going strong. Loads of other sports are trying to find their way of how do we make this more entertaining? How do we bring more eyes to it? What do you think swimming could do to make it more entertaining for the viewer to watch? Well, so, so you know, people have tried. So there's the um, uh, International Swim League, which is a yearly sort of uh, club-based competition that happens uh uh, sort of on a weekly or, or fortnightly basis is cool, but swimming doesn't move that fast. Um, if you bring the same bunch of athletes to compete in the same events every two weeks, you're sort of going to get the same results every time. <laughs> like, so it's, it's not that entertaining. Um, so you do have to like space things out. Like, I, I think swimming is very limited in terms of frequency of event, but when you do have an event, I think it's really important to make it the most possible entertaining show ever. Uh, and so uh, British Swimming has just had the Olympic trials run last week. And I understand why they've done this. Um, they've, they've sort of got the evening session, which is the, the final session that runs from 7 p.m. and is broadcast on live BBC, Red Button, and on live YouTube streaming, I think. So really cool to have this national broadcast. But they've basically mixed in that sort of elite schedule of the evening, that prime time slot, if you like, they've got junior finals, B finals, para finals, and finally what they what they called the Paris finals, which is basically the, the Olympic, the actual Olympic trial final where you got the elite quickest swimmers in the country battling to make a spot on, on the Olympic team. And to me, that should be it. Like if you're I suppose you have to, if, you, if, if I was running the governing body, I would sort of ask the question of, are we trying to entertain our own participants and their families? Or are we trying to grow the sport and make it a show and attract new people, new viewers, and therefore more sponsorship money and just more money in general, make the sport a bigger thing? And if that's what they want to do, like me as somebody who's, who loves the sport, who's been in there for so long, I didn't watch it. Because like the harsh reality of it uh, you know the inclusivity side is nice but the harsh reality of it is that it's not entertaining you can't you know every evening had sort of four or five elite finals and they're spreading them out over like a two hour time span or something because of all the other finals that they're holding and it there's just not enough entertainment there there's not enough value for people to watch every night for a week the olympic trials whereas if they made it like much shorter schedule much more beefy much more like you know hype up the walkouts, hype up the personalities, hype up the individuals, hype up maybe the teams behind them, really make it a show. Um, you know, just think of what the Super Bowl do. Like the, the, the event is there, but then the show around it is what brings people in. It's what brings like people who have no interest in American football. Uh, a lot of women 
you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a men's final and a lot of women watch it. Maybe they love the sport, but maybe they're also there to watch the halftime show, to watch the entertainment, uh, either there or, or on live TV. They basically made this most entertaining possible event out of a sport thing, which is what's bringing so many people and therefore so much money in. And I think that's what's missing from swimming right now is nobody's making an entertaining show. And I think the one thing with swimming that's quite interesting compared to other sports as well, is that so many people can relate to it because so many people swim. Mm. Yeah, it should be a mainstream It should be a mainstream sport, not only every four years at Olympics. You know, you do need a certain amount of time in between major events to make it entertaining and to not know who's going to win every time. But you could have easily, like, even in the UK, you could have easily a really hyped up national event every year, which we just don't have. Like, we're just not bringing in anywhere near enough interest for that. You, know, you can go and find out how much money, how much sponsorship money British Swimming is pulling in every year, and it's, you know, it's six figures. It's, it's not okay. <laughs> they should be doing a much better job. Yeah, and I think when I was a kid, I used to think of, I mean, what the Sydney Sydney Games and people like Ian Thorpe, and they were quite hyped. Yeah, at the time, they were really big, revered swimmers, yeah. and um, obviously there was loads of stuff around people like Ian Thorpe with physically being different to other people, but. That in itself, these kind of, well, the Olympic Games is a genetic pool, isn't it? Yeah. It's just our, I think this is where people also forget in swimming, you genetically, genetics play a big role. Yeah, yeah. Like you cannot, I met with a, a, a leading swim coach, a, a national swim coach from Team GB. And I said, well, what's your criteria? And he was like, well, if I've got an athlete that's below 6'3", I can't really take them. Hmm. Like, I can't really take them right now because I've got in the in the realm of swimming we have right now, there's a 6'7 Ukrainian, there's a 6'5 yeah. a, a Russian, there's Michael Phelps. These are guys who, no matter how much I ask that 6'0 athlete to turn over their arms as fast as they can, they will not beat someone with a wingspan bigger yeah. than theirs that can turn it over just at a slightly less cadence. Hmm. And they will look they, they just will lose like yeah no technique will save them so th there's that part of it which i think sometimes can be quite crushing for people but from an entertainment point of view geez we're looking at the specimens of our right our world right then and to not be able to hide that up is is a missed opportunity yeah exactly so mate I've drunk my my ocean. I get what you mean. The silkiness right? of it. You're yeah. right. It's like yeah. uh, then you'll have like regular water without it afterwards, and you'll see it, it feels dry. Yeah, that was, it was so. So this has just been launched, and like we basically started the first deliveries landed with people last week on Friday. So it's been really cool to get that like first early feedback in because like I've been saying to people like nothing's real until you ask people to get their credit card out. Like. You know, we've been working on the brand. We're talking to people about it. People are hyping it up, like really excited about it. But like, none of that means anything until you see if people actually buy it. And and the first, like the reaction was great. Like we we basically sold out that whole first batch of stock. So really pleased. And then on Friday, when the first sort of feedback came in from customers, that's really another like moment of truth. It's like, what are they going to say about it? Uh, you know, are they going to feel a difference? It's been really cool. Like one person said that um, like their brain fog just went away within like half an hour of drinking it in the morning for super cool wow the, so you said you could you put like one pump in but mm -hmm. can you put more than one in does it change anything but actually have you drunk coconut water before yeah Ge genuine coconut yeah, yeah, sure, water sure, sure, from sure. a straight from a coconut yeah. the, one of my things when i go to the caribbean it's one of my favorite I, mm. I literally get off the plane and i grab a vendor on the side of the road and grab a, a bottle of coconut water and that te it's actually the texture of of coconut yeah. water that i find because it is it's got that silkier feel to yeah, it. Exactly. Obviously, it's renowned for being really great at hydrating mm -hmm. you. Pickle juice, yeah, like that's that. <laughs> yeah. This is the thing yeah. that in Australia they do loads. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, slightly silkier, yeah. which is really interesting. And I've just experienced that. So, so yeah, coconut water powder is a way to like make an electrolyte, na a natural electrolyte powder, um, product, but it's super expensive. It's not the same. And, no, it's not the it's same. Not the same. Um, so what we use is um, uh, concentrated. Uh, inland seawater from the great lake great salt lake of utah so it's got 70 trace minerals in there so it's got like loads and loads of minerals loads of electrolytes fully natural extract but we didn't have to like you know spray dry coconut juice to get a powder it's, it's much more uh much more of a sort of calm process awesome look this has been awesome mate and uh, i've really enjoyed this conversation so where's the best place for them to find out not only where to get the products where to follow you 
tell people where to go. Like, yeah, go, go to drinkocean.cool. And um, that's spelled. So that's, not how you might think it yeah, is. It's, it's ocean, O-S-H-U-N dot C-O. So drinkocean.co. And I'm at Joe Wellstead. Awesome. All the, all the links will yeah. be in the show. One thing we do before the end of the um, show is, is there anything you're, you're watching, reading, listening to that's currently inspiring you at the moment? Uh, well, I talk about Naomi Osaka. I've just started watching her uh, show on Netflix, which is a couple of years old, but I think she's a really interesting character. Uh, she's really cool. Um, and I've sort of tried to stay away from any other sort of self help or improvement books at the moment because I've got I'm just going through so much right now. I'm going through like uh, moving house, uh, having kids. Um, so it's like there's a time and a place for like <laughs> absorbing <laughs> that kind of information. Right now, I'm basically reading fiction, uh, but shows like that Naomi Osaka one are really cool. She, I just love like, learning about. Uh, interesting people and their journeys that are like really stand out nice and and from our conversation is there if you were to set a challenge for someone based on what we've spoken about today what, what would that challenge be well I, I would challenge them to find somebody that knows them and knows the feel that they want to perform in and ask them to uh, as objectively as possible set a goal for them I love that hmm. that's that's told draw mate it's been awesome uh, I love that we've set this up. This feels like I've gone back to my roots at the very start of doing podcasts. So those that are listening, we've ended up doing this in, in my place. And um, it is, yeah, I, I love it. So thanks for coming. And, yeah, thanks, and I'm glad we did this. Yeah, me too.